Hi, everybody. Um, I'm happy to see everybody here. I am going to be introducing Ellen Anderson. Um, she is visiting from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and she's hosted by the Jankowski Lab. But Jill couldn't be here, so she asked me to introduce Ellen, and I'm very happy to do that. Uh, Ellen is originally from Peru, so she's a neighbor from where, neighbor from where I'm from. Um, she got her master's degree from Duke University and then a PhD from the University of Florida. And since uh, the year 2000, she has been a professor at the University in Mexico. And she's there at the Institute for Ecosystem and Sustainability Research. And she has done research in um, tropical ecology and conservation, ecology and conservation of primates and dung beetles and their interactions with plants, in particular uh, with seed dispersal. She has over 40 publications and directed 20 th uh, theses. And she is currently in sab on sabbatical here in the department. Uh, and she will be here until July of next year. And she's actually uh, using Mary O'Connor's office, so you can find her there. And she's going to be talking today about the multiple effects of dung beetle activity on seed and seedling fate in tropical forests. Thank you, Leticia. Can you, can you hear me? This is too high tech for me. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. Uh, it's very exciting. I'm very nervous, too. This is, I thought it was going to be like when I said, yes, I can give a seminar, a small seminar room, but this, this is like an auditorium almost. So yes, I, as Leticia said, I, I am originally from Peru, and I did my undergrad there in biology, and then I did a master's and a PhD in the US, and I did my field work in Manu National Park for my master's, working with monkeys and dung beetles and rodents. And then uh, for the PhD, I went to Central Amazonia in Brazil, in the forests near Manaus. Perhaps some of you have been there. Uh, working in a big, big fragmentation project that um, the um, Smithsonian Institution and the local INPA institution have there. And um, since 2000, I work in Mexico. I, during my PhD, I met my husband, who is sitting here. He's also on sabbatical with me. He's being hosted by the Forestry Department. And um, for our first sabbatical, we went to Seattle. And we liked this, this area of, of the American continent so much that we decided to come back for our second sabbatical to this area, but try to avoid Trump, too, in the process. <laughs> so um, I'll be talking to you uh, today about uh, the research uh, I am doing now and I did before with uh, my students, basically, right now. And uh, I'll be also showing some old data and tell you a little bit of the natural history and the, and the story of how dung beetles interact with plants in tropical forests. You know, let's see if I saw the speaker last week having a terrible problem with this, but it doesn't seem so bad. OK, so I, first of all, I start to, uh, with the acknowledgments. I'd like to start uh, acknowledging and thanking the University of British Columbia, uh, the BRC, and the zoology department, Jill, for being my host during my sabbatical. And also my institutions in Mexico, the CONACYT is the equivalent of the NSF, so most of my funding in Mexico comes from there. And these are my students. I will be sharing with you uh, some of, of their work, too. So um, I said no, not much of a problem. There we go. OK, I'll be talking about the true dung beetles. They're called the true dung beetles those that are in this subfamily here, within the family of the scarab beetles. This is a very, very diverse subfamily, about over 6,000 species worldwide. And uh, they're distinguished from other families that also feed on dunk. And I don't know why they are uh, have the privilege of being called the true ones. The other ones eat dung too. But, uh, and not all scarabini eat dung. Some others eat also our necrophagus or eat some other kinds of decomposing uh, material. And the oldest reliable fossil is, is dates from about 50 million years ago. And, but there's some more dubious fossils, and, and the, the group may be as old as 140 million, according to the fossil record. So, ooh, ooh, it does that on its own. How interesting. 
despair. So dung beetles have played a role in ancient history and many, many civilizations, very old ones, thousands of years ago. Not only in the Egyptians, which is the most well known, but also cultures in South America believed that um, um, a dung beetle formed from clay, the first man and the first woman. And in many myths in Southeast Asia and what is today India and the Greeks and, of course, in Egypt, dung beetles were associated with the creation of the world. And uh, in Egypt in particular, the sun and the scarab both represented the sun. And so it, it was analog to the sun setting down and dying towards the west, and then the next day being rejuvenated and arising. So this is Capri. This is the god of the rising sun. It's sometimes represented as a scarab and sometimes as a human with a scarab head. And interestingly, what apparently some, some people believe is that the, the process of mummy, mummification tries to resemble the process of basically the dung beetle pupa. So if, if a scarab is being able to, uh, from dung, emerge a new being, and then the sun is doing the same every day, why can't humans do that too? They're not as glorious as the sun, but not as humble as the beetle, so they probably can do that too. And so uh, the process of mummification is thought to imitate the, the pupa, the grub, no, not the grub, the pupa of the uh, dung beetle. So what do dung beetles do besides being responsible for all of creation? Well, they, they eat dung. Those that eat dung, eat dung. And the adults feed on the liquid part of the dung. The, and then they use it for building nests underground. And they are uh, globally distributed, as I said before, and uh, except in Antarctica and parts that are always covered by snow. But otherwise, you can find them everywhere where there is dung. And, um, there's three basic functional groups depending on how they build their nests and what do they do, what they do with their dunks. These are the dwellers, and they basically lay their eggs in little nests just underneath or inside the dung pile. And then you have the tunnelers, also called the borrowers, or the more uh, elegant name, the paracoprids. These make tunnels just underneath or very close to the dunk pad, and then they start pushing portions of dunk inside. And then you have the, the, like the star of the family here, of the group, the ones that are always depicted in the nature um, videos, the rollers. And they just take a little bit of dunk, make a ball, and roll it away, one meter, two meters, three meters, up to 10 meters, perhaps 15 meters, usually not so long. And then they make the burrow to lay the nest, uh, the, the, so, and then they lay eggs in each of these where the larva will later develop. And of course, this gets rid of all the dung, and this has enormous consequences for the ecosystems. So what are the ecological, uh, ecological functions that are derived from this uh, dung burying behavior they have. And this has been well studied since the 60s and before, but mostly in grassland and uh, pastures, productive uh, systems, also lots of experiments in control environments, mostly also in the temperate zones, not so much in the tropical forests, and not so much in natural conditions. But what they do uh, with their dung burying behavior is they aid in soil conditioning. So by making the tunnels, they aerate it, and they make it more uh, uh, porous. This is called bioturbation. They help in nutrient cycling. They help avoid the loss of much nitrogen that is in the dung. This will, in turn, help uh, the plants to take up, makes, makes some of the nutrients more available to plants, and this increases uptake by them. And it has been shown to increase uh, growth of pasture plants. And it also helps their pests like fly pests and enteric parasites that are in the dung or breed in the dung. And so by burying the dung, they will help controlling those populations or also just lowering the transmission rate. 
And uh, recently, uh, some studies have shown also that they may be quite important in lowering the emission of some greenhouse gases associated with the cattle industry. And so there is a lot of things they do and that have value for human beings. And so these are called ecosystem services. And people have actually gone in several studies, not many, but several studies, and tried to put a, a, a dollar number to it. And they have come up with huge numbers. Like in the UK, they estimate about almost $600 million per year in value for, their ecos for the uh, ecosystem services associated with dung beetles. In the US, the study calculated almost 400 million. And in, in a state in Mexico, just the most recent study, just for one state, also almost $500 million. It varies how these estimations are done, and most likely they are underestimated, but it can be arguable. Uh, and so you may know about the, the problem they had in Australia. In Australia, when they brought in cattle, they, they have some native dung beetles, but they are adapted to feeding on marsupials, more marsupial dung. And so they had hectares and hundreds and thousands of hectares just being fouled and covered with cow dung. And so they, they started a huge, huge project in the 50s and 60s. They introduced dung beetles mainly from South Africa. And they had a great success. It was one of those success-introduced species stories where they really got rid of, of most, much of the dung with, with the beetles that uh, stayed there, which was about eight species that finally are doing the job in Australia. Um, so what was going on in the tropics? In the tropics, I want to introduce this, this person who is very, very, has been tremendously influential and is one of the fathers of ecology in, in Mexico, really. Well, started one of the pioneers starting uh, ecological research, Gonzalo Hafter, and he's still active. And he works with dung beetles. He's an expert on dung beetles. He had worked any aspect on dung beetle nesting behavior, biogeography, evolution, and you name it. And so in the 90s, he said, OK, this is a neat group also for other kinds of studies. And he started getting interested into biodiversity issues and uh, in modified landscapes and, and how to measure, how to assess the effects of disturbances. And he proposed his pet group uh, to do that. Because, and he argued, well, there are several reasons. And there, this is the first uh, one of the first articles that came on this topic, but others have. Uh, developed more the idea. Well, this is a group that is species rich, rich and abundant. It's uh, easy and, ex and expensively sampled. It's well known taxonomically. Responds to different kinds of disturbances, and uh, so it, it has been started. And, and you can see a tremendous amount of work being uh, using dung beetles as focal taxon. Uh, for assessing biodiversity, monitoring bi biodiversity, usually associated with human, some kind of anthropogenic disturbance. So this happened here in the early 90s. And at the same time, two other things happened. And I'm switching here to primates. Why am I doing this? Because I'm going to talk about seed dispersal by dung beetles of seeds in monkey dung or in general by uh, mammals, but it started with, with primates, really. And people had been studying seed dispersal for a long time, and it was a favorite topic in ecology and evolution. But mostly, it was most of the work had been focusing on birds and bats. And really, primatologists were occupied with what primates were eating. And yes, of course, they were eating a lot of fruit but not from a plant point of view, not as seed dispersers usually. And so this started in the late 80s to take a little bit of momentum. But even in the beginning of the 90s, there were only worldwide, only five publications about that focused really from the plant point of view on primate seed dispersal. And um, the difference with, with uh, with birds, well, not, that's not really the difference. Also, birds will regurgitate, but mostly also defecate. But the difference is, this is the, these are mammals. Their dung is different, and also they tend to be bigger than birds in most cases. And so what happened here with the seeds is that mostly they are surrounded by dung when they are deposited on the forest floor. 
So this is one thing that happened. Started, people started working more with mammalian seed dispersal, not so much with birds anymore. Well, they continued working with birds and bats, but terrestrial mammals started being in focus. And then the other thing that happened was that Jean Shub proposed a framework for studying seed dispersal. Until then, and, and it was very much focused back then on how effective a disperser is, focusing on animals, but you can, you can uh, apply it to any vector of dispersal, really. And he proposed the idea of effectiveness, because until then people had been talking about an animal being a good disperser or an important disperser, a reliable disperser, all kinds of terminology. No one really knew what people meant by it. And so he said, okay, let's put some order here. Let's talk about effectiveness of seed dispersal. And it will have two components. It will have a quantity component, which is just a number of dispersed seeds. And we'll multiply that by the quality component, which is the probability that the, one of those dispersed seeds will actually become a reproductive adult. In reality, particularly when you work with trees, that's difficult to measure, so people use proxies, and usually it's some measure of seed survival, seedling establishment, seedling survival, and it usually doesn't go well beyond that, unless you're working with annual plants and people can actually measure this. The thing is that, so seed fate started really becoming an, an important issue and still is, but it's difficult to measure because then everything that affects seed fate after it has been deposited will determine seed quality, the seed dispersal quality, and thus dispersal effectiveness. And for the case of mammal, mammals, one thing that was not being taken into consideration is that, yes, most seeds are defecated and so they end up being deposited in fecal material. And it has to be taken into consideration. So people started seeing now seed dispersal as a more complex, multi-stage process where you start with seeds in the plants, and they can fall on the ground and be taken as also as primary dispersers from the tree or from the, from the ground. But the story for the primary disperser doesn't end there if we want to assess its effectiveness. We have to go beyond and all which is here is really the quality component of effectiveness. What happens to the seeds afterwards? So they may, they may germinate, best case scenario, and establish seedlings. But what people started seeing is that often seeds were removed. <coughs> and it still is the case seed, uh, that people assume that removed seeds equal predated seeds. So when you went back to your experiment, didn't find a seed, Okay, it's gone, it's dead. But then they realized maybe this is not so the case. There are lots of secondary dispersers and not just dung beetles. Also rodents, which are the bad guys here because they eat seeds, they often will also act as secondary dispersers. <coughs> so what was the story then? If we wanted to assess the effectiveness of a primary disperser, be it a, a mammal in this case, a monkey, then we have to take into the consideration how this animal will deposit, where, how, when does it deposit the seeds, and what animals come are attracted and affected by many aspects. These are just a few that have to do with the primary disperser, but will affect also if these other guys come or not and what they do. So things associated with the primary disperser, for example, size and the diet of animals, will depend the texture, the smell, the size of the dung, uh, and the seeds, how many seeds are clumped together. And the dispersal pattern will be affected by the behavior. And uh, the social structure, is it solitary? Is it family groups? Is it the fish infusion, like the spider monkeys? And also, all those aspects are related to the, to the primary disperser, but will also affect the secondary dispersers the seed predators, and I'm simplifying here, I'm not even considering pathogens or other abiotic factors even. So this is the same figure as before, only modified to show you what dung beetles do with the seeds. So basically, dung beetles, again, they eat dung. They don't eat the seeds. Although we don't know if the grubs 
may some when they start developing they have different kinds of mouth parts than the adults they may actually prey on some of the seeds but that's unknown <coughs> so the red things here are the seeds and so anything that is a movement of the seed after the primary dispersal vector and it can be the primary dispersal can be wind if you wish anything after it's deposited any other movement is called secondary dispersal even if it happens three four times it doesn't matter it's secondary dispersal and so dung beetles can disperse seeds in different ways mostly horizontally mostly done by the rollers when they integrate some of the seeds in the dung ball or more often just vertically or it can be both if it goes diagonally like this So this led some people to propose that perhaps there are some systems that aren't as simple. And they called it, this is a name that was sort of used in the 70s, and, and no one paid attention to it. And so it was revived. The term is deplockery. A deplockery system is when you have a primary disperser and secondary dispersers being of different species, different groups. So it doesn't include when you have primary dispersal by wind and then the seed being moved again by wind. It has to be different agents. And they propose also that it, it's sort of a package and it evolved as a package because of selective pressures and because of it, it having certain advantages than when you only have one disperser. So in that, to distinguish it from primary and secondary dispersal, they call it phase one dispersal and phase two dispersal. That just complicates things, I think, unnecessarily. It's still secondary dispersal. But the thing is, they argue that the advantages are usually different. So the primary disperser will give to the plant the advantage of escape, escape from a zone near the parent tree where there is distance-dependent mortality or density-dependent mortality, or colonization of new areas randomly, while the phase two often will put the seed, and we are also talking about things like uh, um, seeds being taken by ants, for example, into ant nests, and uh, rodents um, scatter hoarding seeds. And in common, m m many of these aspects have that they, the, the seeds will end up lightly buried or deeply buried sometimes, uh, which is not so good. And so they argue that this gives the advantage of directed dispersal. That this is an advantage where the movement of the seed is deterministic and it goes to sites that have a some certain probability associated with it being better for the seed to survive or for the seedling to establish. So let's look at the numbers. What, do dung, what are then dung beetles doing? This is a review I did many years ago and shows you uh, from different parts the, the, these had, uh, were the studies that had been done back then. And I show you here this picture. These are not seeds. These are beads. This is a neat thing you can do with dung beetles. You can use, because of the, the seeds are contaminants for them, you can do, use other things like plastic beads or wooden beads. And they will try to remove them. And that's actually what they do. And what you see here, if the seed or bead is too big, then they will actually exclude it. It's not a good idea to have a big contaminant in your dung ball and um, if your larva is supposed to be feeding on the dung and not on the seed. But if you see here, the amount of seeds that are buried, and this is just burial, can be quite high for small seeds. But even very, very large seeds, three centimeters, can some of them be buried by dung beetles. And what about horizontal dispersal? This has, people have not paid much attention to this aspect because it's quite limited. Usually it's within a meter. But it doesn't mean it's not important. So if you have a, I don't know, imagine a tapir dung, which hundreds of seeds in there, or even a monkey dung, and it has hundreds of seeds. Only one will become a seedling just because of the proximity. So even if you have dung beetles moving those seeds a little bit around, up to 50 centimeters over there, perhaps then you'll have more seedlings, five, 10 seedlings that can eventually become a reproductive adult. So this is a study where they showed, they did some manipulations and they showed that indeed 
when you did not exclude this is with dung but dung beetles excluded this is just the seeds with soil and these bars here which are higher are the ones where dung beetles were allowed to come in and do their business and so they show that yes the nearest neighbor distance of seedlings was greater with dung beetles uh, were allowed to bury the dung this is uh, showing how the amount of dung also affects. And again, this is an aspect that is related to the primary dispersal. If you have a big animal, it's big dung piles usually. But it also depends on its behavior. And here you see, so the, the, the lines on top represents seeds that were in a larger amount. And I'm not talking huge. This is 25 grams of dung. Whereas the lower lines represent seeds that were just in tiny bits of dung, 5 grams and they tend to be, have a lower probability of being buried. Again, the effect of seed size, the same as before, but again, but a new effect. The effect of how much dung is surrounding the seed will also affect if it's deposited underneath the ground or not. And also, of course, the size of the beetle. And again, these are nice. You can manipulate them, you can put them, different species. And here we did some experiments just with a single species and three species of seeds. And so this here is the largest beetle bearing more seeds, basically. And um, these are the small and the medium seed. This is the large seed. It just makes sense. Larger beetles will have um, less, um, well, what would you say? They will be less picky with the seeds in the dung because given their size, it's not there, they don't represent such a big contaminant. And also their behavior. As I told you before, they're rollers, and they have to be more selective because they have to do a ball and roll it away. And that takes a lot of energy, and they have to do it quickly, or otherwise another one will come and steal it from them. So um, they try to clean the dung before they roll it away. And so it, what you see here, the circles are... Uh, roller dung beetles doing the job of burying seeds and they don't bury so many as the tunneler beetles which are shown here. But small seeds, everybody will uh, bury most of them. So what are the aspects of the primary dispersers? Here's what we did is compare two species of monkeys. These are monkeys uh, that are pretty much the same size. They eat many of the same species of fruits. Yes, howler monkeys eat more leaves. So the, the dung varies. And also the defecation, the behavioral patterns are different. And so we saw, first of all, that all of them had an effect. But interest, so the dung type, if it was this monkey or this monkey, had an effect. This is the percentage of seeds buried. Also, when they are in clumped dispersal, so uh, you have many pieces of dung with seeds. It's mostly what happens when they wake up in the morning and the whole troop defecates. You have a clumped dispersal pattern for the seeds. And then more dung beetles are attracted. And, and yes, indeed, they have a better chance of being buried by dung beetles. And um, also the interaction. So only for one of the monkey species was there a different for this for the spider monkey satellis when it was in scattered versus um, a clump dispersal system so and we repeated this in other systems this was uh, done in Colombia and we repeated this in, in in Guatemala and in another site in Colombia and results are not always the same they're not necessarily consistent and depends also the species of monkeys but just Stressing the point that who is defecating really affects of what happens through the secondary disperser later. And so what happens to the seeds? Why is it so good that the dung beetles bury the seeds? Mostly they avoid seed predation and mostly rodents. So that's what we looked at. But it could also be ants. It could be all other kinds of predators. And this is the ability here of rodents finding seeds and preying on, of, on them if they are buried. If they are buried really deeply, then they just don't find them. If they're buried shallowly, some of them will be found and preyed upon. But other uh, aspects of being buried can also be advantageous for the seeds. And for example, just avoiding desiccation, finding some better microenvironment can also, but we haven't looked into that yet. And this here, we have all, 
each of these is a different seed species. This is, again, work in Brazil and other people in French Guiana and other people in Uganda doing experiments to see what happens to the seeds in different depths is that if they are able to emerge as seedlings. And so we see a negative effect in all of them with seeds buried at these different depths, and some of them were not replicated in the different sites for the, by the different researchers. So that's why you see some missing lines. But basically, for some seeds, it's not good to be on the surface, like for these, and it's better to be a little bit buried. But as, long, as soon as you get by 5 or 10 centimeters, the seeds germinate, but they are not able to break the surface and emerge, so they die. So is it good or is it bad then? Not many studies have followed the fate of naturally buried uh, seeds by beetles until seedling emerges. This is one of the studies that I did back, back then. And for 11 plant species, and these are all really large seeded species, and the, in the white bars you see seeds that were defecated by the monkeys and that were not buried by dung beetles. For some reason they were too big, they were excluded, and so their probability of establishing a seedling is lower when compared in most cases, but you can see not all of them, but in most cases, the probability of establishing a seedling was much larger when you had those seeds buried by dung beetles. So how else may dung beetles affect tropical plant regeneration? Just by cleaning the seeds, they may help seeds avoid being attacked by pathogens, um, or just uh, being detected also again by predators. They pre rodents cue to dung very easily. So just by removing the dung, like in this case, this dung beetle will not bury this seed, but it may clean it. So this, but we have measured that yet. No one has measured it yet. And it can affect seed dynamics. Okay, there's seed bank. There's just not the seeds on top, but also the ones that are already buried. So they're moving soil up and down and making tunnels. So that must surely affect the seed bank. And we are looking, starting to look into that. Also seedling performance. So people have shown for pastures and for crops that dung beetle activity is beneficial. What about in a natural setting in a tropical forest? That this happened too. We are starting to look at that. And adult plant performance for some plants, does it even affect perhaps the amount of fruits? No idea. So the seed bank dynamics, because they, when they do the tunnels, they excavate the soil to make space for the tunnel, right? So they bring huge amounts of soil out. The, the bigger the beetle, the more soil they bring out. And of course, there may be some seeds in there. That, the seed bank is full of seeds, small seeds mostly, um, but also larger ones. And by doing an experiment where we put um, plastic beads, and we were actually not going to measure this, we were just measuring the seed dispersal. But then my student went back to the same sites repeatedly to repeat the experiment in the same sites to have a temporal vari variation in account. And then she started seeing some seeds that had been, she, she luckily used beads of different colors. So she started seeing beads that had previously been buried. She had accounted for as buried a month ago. She, and then when she put dung again, it was again on the surface. So they're bringing back seeds. So we measured this. It's really not that much, but these are just the seeds that come back all the way to the surface. And the percentage is low, but we figured, okay, these are the ones that we are seeing. How many more are being moved in this vertical uh, soil profile that we don't know? And so with my student now we're at Los Tuxlas, we're doing an experiment where we put seeds in, in PVC cylinders at known depths. So we're putting them at 5 centimeters of depth and at 10 centimeters. And then we're of different sizes. These are the sizes we're using. And then we're covering it with soil so that they are at this given depth and at this given depth. Then we put a little bit of dung on top and let dung beetles come. The natural community, you just colonize and bury the dung. And then with lots of patience, she will just take centimeter by centimeter of soil and measure where the seeds are found. And yes, indeed, so these are the different colors for the different um, sizes. 
this arrow marks where we put the seeds. So most remain where they are. If you see, this is broken here because most are there, and these were put at 10 centimeters. But again, as we see before, a low percentage, but still some, are being moved upwards, but also some are being moved more deeply. So they are moving lots of seeds around. In the, and, and so they are affecting the seed bank dynamics. So the idea is, okay, perhaps not for those going downwards, but for those coming up, uh, is this affecting the seedless, seedling establishment? Because many seeds that are buried in the soil, they will eventually need to be taken back closer to the surface so that they can germinate and establish as a seedling. And so we just put buckets open um, without a bottom in, in the rainforest, and in some of and we removed all the seedlings, and we put some dung in, in one of them, and let in two days everything is buried. Sometimes in a few hours everything is buried, and then we covered them so that no new seeds would come in, and so everything that is establishing supposedly is coming from the seed bank. And yes, what uh, my student found was that yes, where uh, we had put dung and dung beetles had been active, we have more seedlings and more seedling species than the natural establishment of seeds from the seed bank. So yes, they're having a positive effect. But then if you figured, okay, we should have had another treatment, perhaps just dung without beetles. How about that? We didn't have that back then, so we repeated it, having this other treatment. So in some buckets we put dung beetles and let uh, we put sorry dung and let dung beetles naturally colonize. In others we closed the access to dung beetles but put the dung. And in others we had no no beetles and no dung, and looked again at seedling establishment. And we did this in a dry forest and also in a wet forest, different from the one before. In the dry forest, it seems uh, that, yes, basically here you have no beetles, no dung, as in the previous experiment, and here you have the dungs and the beetles. And again, you see the same difference. This is just for number of seedlings. But it seems that the dung by itself, without the beetles, is also doing something. Can't forget that there's other things in the soil, not just the dung beetles coming in, but there are also, they may be termites in the dry forest. So termites are probably playing an important role here in, in processing dung or other macro invertebrates in the soil. But something is happening just by having the dung also, perhaps just its moisture may help some of the seeds uh, germinate and establish the seedlings. And here in this rainforest, it's just not behaving the way we want it, but this is preliminary. This is only after five weeks. And what she saw at the beginning was that, yes, in the dung beetles, it were, dung beetles were active, there were more seedlings, but when compared to where you had dung and um, no beetles. So here the effect of beetles is important compared to this one. But interestingly, this one that had dung had fewer seedlings than this one that had, for example, no dung and no beetles. Here we're thinking that perhaps the if the dung remains, it takes some surface and that avoids, perhaps hinders seedlings to emerge. But this is just preliminary, so we have to continue with that and see what happens. So, and then what happens to seedlings? This is all going on with seeds. What happens if the dung is falling in the vegetation, it's falling in the understory, it's falling near plants all the time? What happens to the plant that is next to the piece of dung that is being buried by dung beetles? So. We looked at seedlings of this species, which is a moraceae, and we placed dung near the base of them. And in some, we allowed dung beetles to colonize. In others, we did not allow the dung beetles to colonize. In others, we didn't put any dung. Mm -hmm. So these were, again, the three treatments. And this is what we found for this one species. And this is for nitrogen. So, yes, we know that, of course, if there's dung, the, the, the soil will be increased in nutrient content. But is this reflected in the plant as well? And so we um, took measurements for foliar nitrogen and foliar phosphorus. And in, in both cases, yes, the difference was significant. For these here are is the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus when you had dung beetles active where compared you didn't have beetles or, uh, or dung, 
and here you had beetles, uh, no beetles, sorry, but dung. But really the difference, at least for phosphorus, the dif difference is made when you have the dung beetles incorporating it into the soil. And here you see that uh, there was a lot of turnover of leaves, but net growth in terms of number of leaves, the seedlings with dung beetle activity were doing good, better, but they were dying more also. So the percentage of survival was not so good. And many of these seedlings uh, started to die. We don't know exactly why. It seemed like perhaps some pathogen attacked them. It has been seen with herbivores that, yes, when seedlings have more nutrients, they're also more yummy. They attract more uh, predators, more herbivores. It can be also the same with pathogens. But So we're repeating those experiments with more species in a different tropical forest. So switching gears a little bit, show you what else you can do with dung beetles, using them as a focal taxon for assessing habitat changes and also for uh, assessing the relationship be between biodiversity and function. And as I said before, they're easily sampled. You just need some pitfall traps. They can be sampled in other ways, but most people use pitfall traps. They can be lethal, and so they fall in here, they drown. Or they can be live ones where you capture them and take them to the lab, store them, and then you release them again. And so things like this is what, what you can see here. What I want you to pay attention here is that this was done in a dry forest. And we have deciduous forests in most of the landscape. But near the rivers, you have semi-deciduous forests. But these are next to each other. They have the similar plant composition, but they differ a lot in plant structure. This, this forest here has a taller canopy. Uh, it doesn't lose its leaves so much. And Interestingly, although, and they are next to each other, but the, the communities of dung beetles are responding to this vegetation structure and they're dissimilar from each other. And they, they are even more closely, uh, uh, more similar to the ones in secondary forests. Even though this secondary forest had similar structure to this, it was all secondary forest, but it was dominated by just one species of tree. And so the, the, the community was more similar to it. This is a short study we did in Panama, and, uh, where they have this is Bar Colorado Island. And Joe Wright has different sites in a hunting gradient, uh, where sites that are protected and have the full mammal assemblage, or almost full. And then sites that are heavily hunted, or very heavily hunted. And so you see how mammal abundance will affect this is here dung beetle abundance, but it also affected species richness. It also affected um, the different sizes of beetles. The larger beetles are functionally more active uh, be because they simply bury more dung. And so all these things can be measured and different aspects of the dung beetle community can be considered to assess the effects of disturbances. They are responsive to habitat fragmentation. This is what I did in, in the big, big fragmentation project they have in near Manaus, where they cleared, uh, they left square areas of 10 hectares and then 1 hectare, and they have that continuous forest. And looking at amounts of th this is individuals of dung beetles and species here per trap, the ones that are attracted for one trap only. And interestingly, this in red, you see the 10 hectare fragments here. These, they had more beetles, and we think these fragments uh, still had howler monkeys in them. And so, but when in the continuous forest, you usually have a howler monkey troop in 30 hectares, here they were in 10 hectares. So, more dung per unit area and apparently more beetles happily there. But the one hectares were not doing so good in terms of species. And it affected the function. So here is dung removal. This is continuous forest, the 10 hectares. Uh, it varies also depending on the, on the fragment. The ones that were more affected were the ones uh, that only had one hectare. And this is seed burial. Again, effect on some of the fragments, 10 hectare fragment and the one hectare fragment, much more seed burial in the continuous forest. And this goes all the way to seedling establishment when looking at the one hectare fragment. 
Also, you can do things with them to see how uh, landscape level or patch level things in fragmented landscapes affect them differently. And this is a study done not by a student of mine, but I was in her committee, and she looked at different metrics at the landscape and the patch level. So these are at the patch size. And in, in both cases, dung beetles were affected. This is uh, richness affected mostly by the loss of forest cover at the landscape. It was forest cover loss, so percentage of forest remaining was uh, positively associated with um, richness of species, and at this patch size, the size of patches. But other metrics were, well, the patch shape was also an important attribute in determining their uh, richness, they affected negatively, and also the amount of open matrix in the surrounding, surrounding the, the focal fragment was also uh, negatively affected strongly uh, the richness of tongue beetles. And also they are affected by land use intensification. And here, this is uh, this, this paradigm in, for tropical ecology conservation in particular, you may have heard of land sparing versus land sharing. Just focusing on land sharing, the idea is if you have human-dominated landscapes and you uh, can have crops that sort of are more complex in vegetation structure and a composition uh, that may even be similar to forest habitat, then you can uh, harbor a lot, a lot of biodiversity there. And uh, this is, but not all shade crops like shade cocoa, like shade coffee are the same. So you have uh, a gradient that goes from very high conservation value with uh, low management intensity where you have rustic cocoa or coffee or, I don't know, allspice or palm, all kinds of products that can be grown in this kind of system. And here, as you go towards here, you increase management and you tend to decrease the value for conservation. And so you can look at dung beetles in this system. We had a, I had a student here looking in the Lacandona rainforest region. We have very, very big chunks still of conserved rainforest, but you can you also find rustic cocoa plantations, you find more intensively managed cocoa plantations, and you find very intensively rubber monocultures. These still have a canopy, they're at 12 meters high, you have trees, so you would wonder, well, maybe these aren't so bad. This is still agroforestry. So, um, but they weren't so good. This is looking at the dung beetles. So here, the ordination, you have forest and rustic cocoa, Together, you have the more intensively managed cocoa plantations being different in terms of the dung beetle community, and also the monoculture of rubber being different. And I'm just showing you some of the variables that we measured. And this is number of individuals, and this is the amount of soil excavated, which relates very directly with the amount of dung buried and with the number of seeds dispersed and all the other functions. And so you see, again, what you see here is that the Rustic cocoa is holding much of the community, and it's doing much of the same function as you see in the forest here. And um, but then, drastically, the abundance of the dung beetles declines in the more um, intensively managed cocoa plantation and in the rubber monoculture. And also, of course, then the function declines. And you can use dung beetles also to assess the effectiveness of restoration projects. Usually, when you evaluate the success of a restoration project, you uh, measure plants or measure so soils. See, not that many uh, studies um, assess how uh, the animals are doing. So you can use dung beetles to see if they're also being recovered. This was uh, in a dry forest. This is the conserved forest. And these were cattle pastures where the cattle had been excluded for, I don't know, I can't remember, several years now. And in some of the plots, so this and this is similar, natural regeneration going on. But in these plots, they uh, did some more active restoration by planting big seedlings. They were already one year old. Huge effort, very costly. and. Sure enough, probably because of the time that had elapsed, only three years, four years, we didn't see any difference really. These two are the expensively restored sites, <laughs> and this here is a natural regeneration in terms 
of abundance of beetles, species, number of species, and their functions here, dung removal, seed dispersal. So after three years, we can't really say that the expensive restoration is paying off in terms of dung beetles and their functions. So because they're so easy to work with, it's, it's, it's a good idea to do this kind of assessment because if you have a system where natural regeneration is doing as well as an expensive restoration, then perhaps you're better off just leaving the nature restore itself. You can assess that easily with dung beetles. And just this last slide. Uh, we try to work with the communities. And in, in Mexico, unfortunately, in, in the school systems, there is no implementation of any uh, environmental education programs within the curricula. So whenever we, and this everywhere in Mexico, you will be working with people in the places where you are working. We try to get some feedback in terms of the systems we're working. So uh, we've done some leaflets. In this case, I'm showing you the dung beetles, where, but we've done others with showing um, seed dispersal by the animals they have in their plantations. And, uh, or the, the reptiles and the amphibians they have in their cocoa plantations. And, and we try to work with the kids in the schools and, and give them some feedback into a little bit of, of knowledge of, of their system where they live. And I think that's it. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Yes. Thanks for the talk. Correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression was that in the tropics, land and cities would bottom up control and saturation. Maybe that's a wrong impression, but if that's true, then uh, I got the feeling from your talk that young beetles mostly mediate outcome of the tribe in specific competition. That. But I'm wondering, I were to remove all the young beetles from the tropics, that I don't know. I don't think anybody can answer that. It's, it's, it's really, I mean, that's the fun of working in the tropics. It's just not bottom up. There are so many other factors and, and the role of, of herbivores and pathogens and, and there's just so many interacting interactions going on at the same time that uh, things like, like herbivory, for example, play a, a huge role in, in affecting diversity, right? But many of these things are measured at the seed level, at the seedling level, at the sapling level, perhaps. And it's hard to, um, because of the lack of time there is in the generation of, of these long-lived plants, to be able to ascertain what will be the long-term effect. And we're talking really long, long term here and, and maintaining these uh, species diverse systems. So no, I can't answer. People don't totally agree, so many studies have been conducted and sometimes you find a very strong relationship with abundance, sometimes you find a strong relationship with biomass, sometimes you find a strong relationship with species richness, sometimes people measure functional diversity and that's the strongest uh, predictor of function. Sometimes it's several of those, so it varies a lot, and there's no clear, because most, many of these communities also vary in how many species they have and, and what they're doing, so it's probably very context specific. And uh, to f the first part of the question, which was, was trying the difference between the, the, the plantations, 
the rustic cocoa is really rustic, so it looks like a forest. It's very much in in this. I must be honest. I have a compounding factor <laughs> here in this system because the the cocoa polyculture was also small fragments, and they didn't have uh, the mammals. So it could be probably a lack of the mammals. It, the fragmentation itself could also be affecting because they the polyculture cocoa was surrounded by. Um, by pastures or annual crops, whereas the cocoa plant, uh, the rustic cocoa was immersed in a huge matrix of more cocoa plantations and contiguous to forests, one side, the other side, pastures. So the whole landscape setting definitely affects also. The rubber plantations were big and they were immersed in big matrix of rubber plantations, but they are really intense in their management. Uh, they may be using also some agrochemicals that may be affecting the beetles. In this case, probably the change in forest structure. These are neotropical dung beetles that are really sensitive, not, not, not like in Africa where you have many species also adapted to more open savannas. Here they are rainforests. And so if, even if you have a clearing, a small gap, they won't go in there. And um, so the more open rubber plantation probably is not conducive, and the lack of mammals. <laughs> He's been in the rain for Well, they depend on it, so they. But there is tons of it. Don't worry. Uh, if you don't have a defaunated site, like the hunted sites, right? So they they quite generalist. Most of them, they they don't they are not picky with the dung. So usually they tend to, pre to prefer mammal dung, and within mammal they tend to prefer uh, herbivorous. But many of them will also eat other rotting materials if they must. And um, what else did you ask? <sighs> All of it. So you would have to calculate first how much is produced. And there, just one beetle? Probably about twice their size. And and then because they use it for laying for, for, for their nests and for feeding of course, so they feed some, but they, they as much as there is they can do multiple nests. And I mean, yeah, they, they're quite efficient. It depends also on the system. And some systems, even tropical systems which are more seasonal, during the dry season they will just stay inactive. And so that then you can have dung accumulating, or probably termites and other macrofauna taking care of it. Um, but in, in tropical, more humid rainforests, uh, they are very abundant and they are very efficient, uh, as long as you have a full set of the community working there. One more question. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Well, that's what they have showed in this system. When you look at the different interactions with different animals, and I don't know exactly what would happen with the interaction with dung beetles, but for example, in the defaunated sites where that you lose bigger mammals that are acting both as predators and as dispersers. You're losing the dispersal, but you're also losing the predation, and it's actually benefiting some of the plants they studied, which are the pal some palm uh, species. You're getting more infestation by brookids, but it's, it's not overwhelming the, the um, success of the plants, so they're recruiting more seedlings. So compensatory effects, again, 
are very very context specific and and difficult to um, predict unless you have some empirical measurements of of your system and um, my guess here would be yes you have full assemblage of, of tank beetles in Barro Colorado and you have frugivores you have the mammals are there and I can't remember, I don't think in, in Barro Colorado I have a huge problem with seed predation. It's in the smaller islands. Um, and, and also they have a, a similar system in Venezuela and Lake Guri where they also did a, uh, inundated the forest for uh, hydroelectric and, um, and they have sites, small islands where they have just things going very bizarre, uh, where they have a few monkeys, for example, still living there, and so they have heaps and heaps of, of dung accumulating. In other pieces and other islands, they have many herbivores just exploding, and they have much activity of leafcutter ants. So, so it's hard to tell, and often it, it will take some time until it settles down, and you can say, if there are compensatory effects or not, but there are in, in some occasions, yes. Okay, well, thank you so much, Ellen, for a very interesting talk. And